The opening session for the year is going to be a lecture, a very important one, entitled Historic Heresies and Their Continuing Influence Today. Our guest speaker will review the major heresies the church has dealt with and condemned and how some of them are back in various sects and aberrant teachings. We're very pleased to have as our guest Dr. Eve Tibbs. Dr. Tibbs is an affiliate assistant professor of theology at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, where she has taught since 2005. She holds a PhD in theology which, with a minor in church history and an MA in theology with an emphasis in biblical studies, both from Fuller Seminary. Dr. Tibbs has served as chair of the Eastern Orthodox Studies Group of the American Academy of Religion, and she is the ministry leader for church education in the Greek Orthodox Metropolis of San Francisco and a member of the Metropolis Council. Dr. Tibbs attends St. Paul's Greek Orthodox Church in Irvine, where she is a chanter, choir director, and leads a Bible study and with her husband, Steve, coordinates the Sunday, uh, Sunday School Church program. You're very busy. <laughs> They're the parents of three daughters, each married, and grandparents of 5.4 <laughs> little ones. Number six comes in August, God willing. You know, we, we're not here to judge. <laughs> We congratulate you on your 5.4 grandchildren. <laughs> Dr. Tibbs says her favorite title is Yaya, Greek for grandmother. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Tibbs, but with smiles and love rather than applause, because as is our custom, we don't applaud in church. <laughs> I've got one. I gotta turn this way, don't I? Let's see if that stays. Well, good morning. How to begin? How to begin a talk on heresies in the church? One of my very good friends from St. Paul's, who is a church school teacher, um, was a little bit apprehensive about beginning a discussion on a potentially thorny issue with her high school, Sunday school class on contemporary moral issues. So she sought the advice of um, a spiritual mother, Gerondisa, which is abbess of a monastery, who said that when presenting difficult or sensitive topics, always begin with something positive, spiritually enlightening. And I think that's really uh, good advice. I think that's the best way to begin a discussion about heresies. The problem is that I'm Greek. I'm 100% Greek, and in case you don't know too many of our kind, I see I'm kind of going in and out, aren't I? Yeah. Let's see. Is that okay? Should we just, yeah. The problem, if you haven't met too many of uh, my kind, I think we're taking a stop here. Thank you. Okay, that's better. Thank you. Well, let me go back and say, um, it's very good advice, but the problem, I think, with me is that I'm 100% Greek, and we Greeks tend not to start out with positive things. We tend to first see what's wrong with everything um, rather than right, and we usually love a good debate. You can ask my poor husband, um, simply for the sake of argument, but also because we tend to be a little bit opinionated and a little bit stubborn. Um, and I confess that I had to think really hard to find something that, to start out with, that was spiritually enlightening and positive this morning. But I, I did find something. And I took my cue from our Orthro service. The very first hymn is entirely related to our topic today. <clears throat> and here it is in Plagal Fourth for this Sunday. God is the Lord and hath appeared to us. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. There it is. He's come. He's revealed himself to us. 
And that's really one of the most uplifting and positive things that I could possibly say. And the fact that Jesus came materially in the flesh and dwelt among us and continues to be among us through the Holy Spirit because he is truly God is foundational for this topic. Now, I've given my little talk here a subtitle, Nothing New Under the Sun, from Ecclesiastes 1.9. It's attributed to King Solomon. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Throughout history, human beings have had trouble following God's will and teaching, some from error, some from laziness, some from out-and-out rebellion, and they continue to do so over and over again. There's nothing new under the sun. Anyway, speaking of the solar system, sorry, I have no better segue than that. This coming Tuesday is the 523rd anniversary of Christopher Columbus's return to Spain after his voyage. And I'm curious, how many of you remember being taught that Christopher Columbus was the one that figured out that the earth was spherical and not flat? How many of you? Show of hands. Anybody taught that? I was. A few of you were. The idea was that learned people thought the earth was flat and Columbus came back and he proved to everyone, all of the learned religious people, that the earth was not flat. It's a myth. And we now know that that myth was attributed to Washington Irving, the novelist, who in his 1828 three-volume history of the life and voyages of Christopher Columbus added a debate between Christopher Columbus and the religious folks of the day that never happened in which purportedly the churchmen were insisting that the earth was flat. But the truth is that by the 3rd century BC, my Greek ancestors already knew with certainty and had established the physical fact that the earth was spherical. And the learned people of Columbus's day knew that as well. The flat earth mythology began in the 19th century over the ideological setting created by Darwinism and evolution. Because the book of Proverbs pictorially describes God circumscribing the earth as a circle, making, drawing the earth as a circle, not a sphere. And the prophet Isaiah spoke about the earth as having an underside. And so the debate over flat earth was really the debate about modern science versus the religion, that it was now passé. And yet in January of this year, just a few weeks ago, The website of the Flat Earth Society, yes, there is one, announced that a famous rapper, B.O.B., Bobby Bobby Ray Simmons, had joined their cause. And he took to Twitter, promoting with excitement the fact that when he was in a very tall building, he could still see the horizon at eye level, and so the Earth must be flat. A celebrity astrophysicist engaged in a um, Twitter 140-character debate with the rapper, um, you might know him, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's on you know, the History Channel and Discovery and all of that. And he said, quote, flat earth is a problem only when people in charge think that way. No law stops you from regressively basking in it. Absolutely, right? It doesn't matter if the rapper wants to believe the earth is flat, as long as he's not in charge. But it would matter if you needed to compute a long-distance flight path or if he was the architect of a long span bridge, or the Mall of America. They had to determine the curvature of the earth in order to make that huge structure in Minnesota. So it is absolutely true that rapper B.O.B. can regressively bask in false assumptions. But laws do stop doctors from basking in, regressively basking in false assumptions. They have to go to school, they have to pass board exams, they have to show that they have an accurate understanding of illnesses and cures. And so for many practical matters like that, it really does matter where the boundary is between fact and falsehood, where these boundaries are drawn. Because those boundaries are often the boundaries between peril and safety, or between sickness and health. And of course, as we move this morning the boundaries into the church, they're cosmic boundaries, they're spiritual boundaries, and they they affect our health and salvation as well. Because if we have a wrong view of creation and the creator, and a wrong view of Christ, and a wrong view of the practice of our faith, we're in trouble. 
and we risk contaminating others. We risk not having the correct antidote to the sickness of humanity. We risk not having the peace that comes only from the true God and instead suffer turmoil. When we have a flawed image of God, we simply cannot relate to God in the way that we were created to relate, the way that God intended. Now, another novelist who played uh, fast and loose, so to speak, with the truth of history is Dan Brown. You might remember that he is the author of The Da Vinci Code, which was on the New York Times bestseller list for over two years and caused a firestorm of controversy uh, because of its many false claims, such as Jesus having married Mary Magdalene, other blatant errors about Christ, other errors about the New Testament and how it arose in the church. What made it most controversial, in my opinion, is that when Dan Brown first began promoting his book on TV, on national television, he claimed that it was based in historical fact. Despite that it is a novel, the Barna Research Group took a survey, of a national survey of adults who had read the book cover to cover and found that 53% of them said that the book had been helpful in their personal spiritual growth and understanding. That's scary. George Barna, who was an evangelical Christian himself, said that most people simply don't know enough about church history to recognize the false statements. Many Christians go just about this deep, and this is what Barna said. There was Jesus and the Apostles, the book of the New Testament in the first century, Then came Augustine, Luther, Calvin. Then there was Billy Graham and Pope John Paul II. And Barna asks, what about the first 350 years of Christianity? If people don't have any knowledge of history, they have no way to assess the claims being made and no way to combat them. So ignorance is one facet of how the dangerous heresies can take hold. People will read or believe whatever they hear. As a result of my academic work in theology, I I have been asked and sometimes sent to participate in discussion groups with representatives from other Christian traditions. And at one of these study meetings that included Protestants and Pentecostals and Roman Catholics, a statement was being crafted to discuss how each of the various traditions views ministry. And I made the suggestion that at the end of the summary paragraph, we might add two words. Instead of saying, Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, I thought it would be nice, I'm sorry, instead of saying, Jesus Christ, our Lord, I thought it would be nice to say, Jesus Christ, our Lord and God. And I would not have thought that in a Christian study group, those last two words would have been so controversial. To suggest that Jesus Christ is not only our Lord and God was the controversy. Because a representative from one of those traditions, one of those Protestant traditions being represented, said he couldn't support the statement because he didn't believe that Jesus was God. And it turns out that it's dogma in his Protestant tradition, Protestant denomination, that people do not have to believe that Jesus Christ is truly God and truly man. In fact, it's a hallmark of that denomination that people are free to choose to believe whatever they wish They say unity, not uniformity. So what this means is that the people in charge, to again return to the scientist's tweet to the rapper, the people in charge either think that no right belief exists or that right belief doesn't particularly matter. Heresy, and it sounds the same in Greek, eresis, literally means a choice of belief in the Christian context. It means an intentional, formal choice to deny or compromise a core dogma of the Christian faith. A choice to deviate from God's revelation to the church in favor of one's own ideas. It's related not only to one who deviates, but one who divides and leads others astray. In his letter to Titus 3.10, St. Paul says, Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. But the King James Version comes a little bit closer to the Greek word there for the divisive man, heretikon. The divisive person is also the heretic, the one who divides. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition, knowing that he is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. 
So the heretic should be corrected twice and then rejected. So unlike that other denomination, there is no place for indifference to theological matters or to God's self-revelation in history in orthodoxy. When offered evidence of truth, we have two choices. We either choose to trust God's revelation or we choose to be wrong. And to be clear, before I move on to some of the specifics, we're not talking about being mistaken or simply being in error or trying to think about answers to the difficult questions. For after all, God is infinite and we are not. Our minds will never comprehend God fully. So trying to conceive of difficult things is not heresy. It's when one has the wrong answers to the most important questions with the mind and heart that's closed to correction that is problematic. And as we know, the very notion of orthodoxy is right belief, right worship, right glory. The rule of faith of the early church sets the boundaries, what we, what we call the canons today, set the boundaries that are defined by the Holy Spirit. And the apostles themselves were not afraid to call out heresy when it infiltrated the early church. And let me give you a few more examples. In Galatians 1.9, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. And the apostle Peter warns against false teachers among you who secretly introduced destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. And so from the Titus passages quoted in these two, we see that the heretic or the heresy is not just dangerous for the church under attack, the apostolic church under attack, but for the one who is continuing to teach those errors when, been, when having been confronted already with the fact that it is not true. There's a story recounted by St. Irenaeus, the bishop of Lyon in the second century, um, related to him by St. Polycarp, who was a disciple of St. John the Evangelist. And St. Polycarp recounts that when St. John the Evangelist went to a bathhouse in Ephesus and perceived that a heretic was there, he ran out screaming without bathing, let us fly lest even the bathhouse fall down, because Corinthus, the enemy of truth, is within. St. Irenaeus tells another story about St. Polycarp himself, who met Marcion, an early, um, an early heretic. And Marcion says, do you know who I am? And St. Polycarp says, yes, you're the firstborn of Satan. (laughs) St. Irenaeus concluded, such was the horror with which the apostles and their disciples had against even holding verbal communication with any corruptors of the truth. And even today, we can learn a lot from in the 21st century about the fathers because they they had to divide between truth and error. If St. Athanasius, the 4th century Bishop of Alexandria and author of In the Incarnation, had happened to be in my meeting, in the study group I just described, he would have asked a simple question. If Jesus is not God, but a mere creature, how could he save you? St. Polycarp might have called him a name, and St. John might have run from the building, (laughs) lest it fall down around us. The church fathers established what we now call dogma, the important issues. Doctrine is a teaching, but dogma is is an established fact of a faith. Under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the ecumenical councils debated with the difficult issues, the dogmatic issues that were challenging the faith. So before I dig into some of them now, the nitty-gritty specifics of some of the infamous and enduring heretical challenges to the church, I'd like to take a brief survey of personal opinion. Of the two statements that I'm going to read, which do you feel is more important to you? I'm going to read them twice. So here's A. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on a cross outside of Jerusalem about 2,000 years ago. Or B, I have a real and living relationship with God. So I'll read them again. And what I'm looking for is for you to think about which of these you feel is more important to you. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on a cross outside of Jerusalem about 2,000 years ago. I have a real and living relationship with God. No, you're not voting either way. Vote. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on a cross outside of Jerusalem about 2,000 years ago. Okay. I'll get back to this. And, or, I have a real and living relationship with God. Okay. 
about half divided. I will get back to the reason I'm asking this in just a moment. Another contemporary author, author Bart Ehrman, has written or edited 30 books, including five New York Times bestsellers. He's a professor of religious studies at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And so one title of one of these books, just to give you a sense of where he's going, is How Jesus Became God. And he has been described as a leading authority on the New Testament and the history of Christianity. And all I have to say is, Lord, have mercy. Ehrman once was a Bible-believing evangelical Christian, but now he's on a mission to undermine Christianity. With a substantial following, again, five New York Times bestsellers, that Jesus was a regular human man, with a, and his disciples, after the resurrection, merely hallucinated that he had resurrected, and just called it resurrection. He writes extensively on the so-called Gnostic Gospels, like the Gospel of Judas. But the thing is, the church way back then had no trouble seeing the fact that those Gnostic Gospels did not reflect the truth of God. They had already been rejected. Other people like him, one name is Elaine Pagels, believes that these books should be considered as equally valid to the writings of the church that the church regards as canonical scripture through the Holy Spirit. And sadly, there are quite a number of so-called theologians in the Catholic Church with other Protestant denominations who similarly deny the divinity of Christ, his virgin birth, and his bodily resurrection. Some of you may remember learning about the great Albert Schweitzer, the 20th century humanitarian and missionary doctor. He didn't believe that Jesus was God. He believed that Jesus died alone after his followers recognized that he was a failed political leader. And I find it really strange and troubling that Christianity seems to be the only major faith on the face of the earth that has full-time practitioners like scholars, professors, and even some clergy who spend time and energy trying to show that Christianity needs to be totally changed and even abandoned. The other world religions don't do this. Buddhists don't do this. Hindus don't do this. Muslims certainly don't. Imagine that. The late Harold O. Brown, who was a former Reformed Christian scholar, said that he believed Christianity is so loathsome to the evil one that he makes a point of tempting the professors and priests of Christianity to undermine their own doctrines. And in fact, the topic of heresy can only be spoken of within the context of Christianity. All of the heretical teachings were within Christianity. And I think that Harold O. Brown is correct. The evil one hates unity in Christ's and look, looks for ways to call, sorry, the evil one hates unity in Christ and looks for ways to cause people to deviate, divide, diabolo. El diabolo means the one who divides. And as per the scientist to the rapper, to cause us to regressively bask in false assumptions rather than true worship of the true God. It also means that we live in a world where diversity and anything goes, pluralism, matters more than dogmatic truth and holy living. And in many ways, simply being an Orthodox Christian is an ascetic struggle today. As I briefly mentioned, we, in the New Testament, we already see the sprouting and blossoming of some early heresies. The most notable and I think spiritually damaging was Gnosticism, which took many forms. And it was especially insidious since the Gnostics worshipped alongside the apostolic Christians Gnostic ideas have been vigorously refuted in the New Testament by St. Paul, by Jude, by St. Peter, by St. John the Evangelist, as well as several church fathers like Irenaeus, St. Irenaeus, Hippolytus, Justin Martyr, and Tertullian. As it happens, very few of the ancient Gnostic texts had been preserved, so most of our information came from the descriptions of those who were refuting the Gnostics, like St. Irenaeus, until a very interesting thing happened. Um, there was an astounding discovery made in the Nile Valley in 1945 in a town called Nag Hammadi of 47 Gnostic books. And it turns out that St. Irenaeus and others who describe Gnosticism, it was previously thought that they were exaggerating, it turns out that they were pretty accurate. They did a good job of explaining in detail the problem with this sect of Christianity before refuting it. So generally, all Gnostic sects believed that they possessed a a secret special knowledge. 
And that's where the, where the name comes from. Gnosis means knowledge. And they were superior to everyone else, to the unenlightened masses in the church. But doesn't Jesus Christ tell us that even young children come closer to understanding his ways than learned and religious adults? Their simple trust and faith, they knew better than others how to approach God. Simple faith and most of all the ability to love God and love neighbor. So in the Gnostic cosmology, just to give you a brief um, indication of their view, there's an odd pyramid hierarchy of divine beings with a supreme transcendent God up at the top. There's usually a divine mother, and from the two of them come um, hordes of aeons or lesser gods. And so far I've described uh, Mormon cosmology. Then there are more numerous, less powerful, more evil gods. And finally at the bottom are the archons or the evil gods. And in their view, the god of the Hebrew Bible is an archon, an evil god. And therefore, that god, who the Bible says created the heavens and the earth, created it out of defective material. And so the earth is entirely corrupt. Material things are entirely corrupt. And that, of course, it borrows from from Platonic um, philosophy as well. But St. Irenaeus says... Scripture clearly teaches that God is good. The creator is good. And all creation was declared to be good, and God saw it and said it was good. Tertullian emphasized God's freedom to create out of his goodness. And it took a while, but the church fathers finally defeated Gnosticism. And they made sure that the creed of our faith, the Niceno-Constantinopolitan creed, say that fast three times, affirmed belief in one God, creator of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible. Two destructive practices come out of Gnosticism. If an evil God created the world, and everything in the world is evil and and material things are evil, one one problem, therefore, is an extreme form of asceticism, a denial of the flesh, in which the body is abused in favor of elevating the soul or the spirit. The other was the opposite, we, we tend to call that antinomianism or extreme libertinism. Since the body is inherently evil, but the soul is pure, it doesn't matter what you do with your body. One author calls this the sex, drugs, and rock and roll view of, the 19, of 1900 years ago. And both problems still exist. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer called that, that problem cheap grace. It's the grace that you, you bestow on yourselves without discipleship. In the Orthodox view, our salvation is worked out in fear and trembling, like St. Paul says, as we try to grow in conformity to the likeness of Jesus Christ, in synergy with the grace of God. The other problem, extreme asceticism or hatred of the physical body, is actually answered in the person of Jesus Christ, who took on flesh and became a physical human. So the body is not a throwaway. St. Paul told the Corinthians that assuming the likeness of Christ we become temples of the Holy Spirit, and we care for the body during this life. And even after death, the Orthodox are very careful to respect the body. And of course, resurrection will be bodily. Resurrection will include the body, as in Jesus' resurrected body. And that we have saints that are so closely aligned to Jesus Christ in holiness that their bodies have not suffered corruption most recently, Archbishop Dimitri of Dallas. This is a reminder to us of how closely related spiritual and physical wholeness is. They are integrally related to one another. But in Gnosticism, since everything is evil, Jesus could not possibly have been God, nor could he have suffered. Instead, he was pure spirit, and he just mimicked the fact that he presented himself as a human person in order to show how flimsy material, the material prison of creation was. There's one Gnostic myth that says that Simon the Cyrene was crucified instead of Jesus by mistake. All the while, the Gnostic Jesus is looking down at everyone's ignorance, laughing at how foolish anyone could be to worship the God of Israel. This Jesus serves as a spirit guide to enlightenment to show people that this world is is false, that physical reality is false but only the spirit is true. And of course, that's the heresy. 
So even though various forms of Gnosticism, as I mentioned, were declared heresies at various times, there are still Gnostic churches today. In fact, they're experiencing a revitalization since the find of those 47 books at Nag Hammadi in 1945. There is a church called Ecclesia Gnostica, whose national diocese is in Hollywood, just below the Hollywood sign. And even though we all would probably recognize the peril of such a church, danger, Will Robinson, danger, Gnosticism is prevalent in Christian science, Mormonism, and the New Age movement. Christian science is basically neo-Gnostic. They rely on secret keys of interpretation, and they also deny physical reality. If you think you are physical, you are mistaken. And Jesus will help you learn what he learned to escape from your imagined physical limits. So I'm sitting here in this beautiful and sacred Orthodox temple, and we all may be lulled into thinking, well, I'm safe. I'm not joining a Gnostic church, don't worry. I'm not going to become Christian science, so I'm okay. Maybe. Do you read... Christian spirituality books? Do you read any contemporary spirituality books? Like The Secret by Rhonda Byrne, one of the books on Oprah Winfrey's book club. No, good, you're shaking your head no. (laughs) It's Gnostic through and through. And Oprah was taken with another of the best-selling books on her book club list, A New Earth, that she partnered with the author Eckhart Tolle to present weekly online webcast classes He uses biblical material, but this Jesus Christ is just one of those rare people who, like Buddha, achieve divine consciousness. Let me read an excerpt from chapter 10 of this bestseller that Oprah loves. The only existence the future actually has is as a thought form in your mind. So when you look at the future for salvation, you are unconsciously looking to your own mind for salvation. You are trapped in form. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, writes the biblical prophet. The foundation for a new earth is the awakened consciousness. The, heaven, the new heaven, the awakened consciousness, is not a future state to be achieved. A new heaven and a new earth are arising within you at this moment. What did Jesus tell his disciples? Heaven is right here in the midst of you. And so it sounds very positive and uplifting and motivational. But what he's saying, if you pay attention to the words, is there's no... There's no material heaven. It doesn't matter. If you think that Jesus came bodily after the resurrection, you're wrong, because the resurrection occurs within you all the time. And if you think otherwise, you're trapped in form. Michael Philibur, in his book, The Gnostic Trends in the Local Church, surveyed three churches, Reformed, Baptist, and Presbyterian, to see how modern-day Gnosticism has taken root in their churches. And he proposed that church members answer a hypothetical situation in which a son or daughter comes home from college and proposes these questions to you. And here they are. The Christian teaching that Jesus is the same essence as the Father was forced onto Christianity only by a vote at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Think for a moment how you might answer that. We will talk about it. The biblical gospels are really mythical retellings of Jesus by some Christians who wrote so long after the described events that they couldn't really know what happened. And the Gnostic gospel, according to Thomas, is just as valid understanding Jesus as the biblical gospels. One congregation, he says, failed completely because they had no knowledge of history. They had no answers. And so he concluded that where there is a minimal grasp of history in in a church, Christians are defenseless. They are unable to give answers to the Orthodox Christian faith, lowercase o and capital O. So pay attention, paying attention to Christian history, all the way back to Jesus, to the apostles, to the patristic tradition, is essential. Philibur's final question is more telling, and I've already asked you about them, and I'll repeat them. Don't vote this time. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on a cross outside of Jerusalem about 2,000 years ago. Or B, I have a real and living relationship with God. The thought was that if the answers fell into the A category or joined A and B, then the respondents would seem to have a good grasp of the importance of God, God's salvific acts through history, as recorded in the Bible, as foundational for any exper- spiritual experiences they may have. But responses in the B category alone 
seem to mean that the person relies heavily on subjective experience or even emotions. And surprisingly, he said, all of the categories, all of the congregations weighed in heavily on the B question, the subjective side, preferring personal experience over the historical action of Jesus Christ. So I didn't say that it was possible to mix the two. I know that's what you were all thinking. I can't, you, she didn't ask who says they should be together. Orthodox Christianity is certainly a mystical faith, an experiential faith, but it is also, at the same time, a historical faith. It's incarnational. It's divine and human. It's at the same time transcendent and historical and material. So not only can our church claim an unbroken connection to the Church of the Apostles and is faithful to their teachings as found in Holy Scripture and as confirmed in the patristic tradition and through the ecumenical councils, but we, because of challenges to the truth, we can rely on the entire history of our church and we can rely on the witness of the church fathers who defended against those incorrect teachings about the most important things about God and creation. More important than anything found in history is the statements made by the apostles. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten Father, full of grace and truth. So our Savior really existed as a human person who gave us the gift of mystical participation in his divine life. And those two go hand in hand. The next major group of challenges in the church involved Jesus specifically, and scholars call it the Christological controversies. The primitive apostolic church knew the truth of monotheism, um, the, the Shema of Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. They knew this. But the apostles already also knew and experienced that God had a son, and the Holy Spirit had already descended upon them and given them the power of God, the comforter, the spirit of truth. They knew that God had an only begotten son, and he ascended into heaven, and they knew that he sent the Holy Spirit to them. And so if God is one, how do you talk about the son and the Holy Spirit? Doesn't that mean polytheism? And vice versa, if you know that there is a Father, a Son, and the Holy Spirit, how do you preserve God's unity? And that really is the problem of the Christological controversies in the 3rd, 4th, and 5th century. So one solution, one group, um, wanted to preserve the monarchy of God. They're called monarchianists, or soul sovereignty. One God, in one view, um, one God could morph into the other characters. Like actors in a theater, changing costumes or putting on different masks or different hats in order to fulfill a role. This was called modalism. So the one God could act in different modes of being. Since God was only one thing, he could be the Son on earth, he could be the Father in heaven, he could also be the Holy Spirit at different times. And he, it, since God was really, since the Father was really the Son, it would also be okay to say that the Father was crucified on the cross. The Father suffered. And do you know who teaches this view today? Oneness Pentecostals, under the names United Pentecostal and United Apostolic Churches. And so you also might say, don't worry, I'm not going to consider Oneness Pentecostalism. But let me ask you something else. Have you ever described the Holy Trinity using an analogy, maybe to your children or to a Sunday school class? Anybody? What analogy, Chris? On the stage. <laughs> yeah, it was H2O in different forms. So H2O, thank you for bringing that up. H2O in, two, in different forms. You've heard this, right? The water can be ice, it can be solid, it can be a liquid, or it can be a gas. The problem there? Modalism. It's the same thing in different forms. The water cannot simultaneously be ice, gas, and liquid. It's one thing and acting in different ways at different times. Any other analogies? The what? The egg. Egg is popular. 
The shell, the yolk, and the white. What is that? And the clover. Let's do... Oh, I love that one, actually. I kind of like that one the best, but let's, let's go with the clover. Uh, St. Patrick used the three-leaf clover. Modalism. The one thing simply divided into three. And the egg, tritheism. Because they're completely separate. There's nothing really keeping them together. So all of these analogies break down. I love St. Spiridon's. And there's a, there's a, the story is that St. Spiridon, um, Bishop of Trimithundos, who actually attended the first council at Nicaea to defend the divinity of Christ and the Trin- Trinity, held up a brick. And as he was speaking about the truth of, of the Trinity, uh, f- flames went up. Um, the, the sand dripped down, and he was, or no, the, the water dripped down, and he was left with sand in his hand. It's actually one of the better analogies. They all break down. And so I guess my point is, be careful what you teach and how you speak, because it might give, uh, it might do harm by presenting the wrong idea of the being of God. Because we are finite and God is infinite, sometimes it's just okay to say, that's not something we can really describe. Sometimes the best thing you can say is um, what God is not. For example, St. John of Damascus in the 8th century warned, warned us in this way to be careful what we say. And he said, quote, God is infinite and incomprehensible, and all that is comprehensible about him is his infinity and incomprehensibility. And I love that. God is infinite and comprehensible, and that's all we can say. That's the most comprehensible thing we can say. Another ancient view in the uh, monarchianist category was uh, dynamic monarchianism. Dynamic means that something will change. And this is why we so often talk about the sun without change. Um, They taught that Jesus was not divine. In fact, he really probably had no clue what he was all about. And most of these um, dynamic monarchianist views will say that at his baptism, when the Holy Spirit descended on him, That made him in some way divine, that he now understood what his mission was, um, that God had made him a special man with special insights. And, of course, that's a heresy, too. So come along. uh, The fourth century, we meet a priest from Alexandria. His name is Arius. And he hears about this idea that Jesus was a human person that probably didn't know really entirely what he was about. Um, Arius knows the Bible. And when he reads it, he sees something different in there than the entire rest of the church at that time. He thinks Jesus is a created being, that Jesus has more in common with us creatures than he does with God. So not only does he push the idea that the Son was not at all like the Father, but he says there must be a time when the Son was not. In other words, Jesus isn't eternal. There must have been a time when the Son was not. The historical problem with Arius was not so much that he was wrong about who Jesus was, but he was also stubborn and argumentative, which is okay if you're right. But he wasn't. And he was sly as a fox with communicating and promoting his ideas to the general public. He composed songs with his heretical doctrine. There was a time when the sun was not to common drinking melodies, to communicate and promote this idea to everyone he knew. Now, the only drinking song I know is 99 Bottles of Beer on the Wall. There was a time when the sun was not, he isn't like God at all. I don't know. Um, (laughs) But they took to the street at night with torches and singing these songs with banners um, to convince Christians that Jesus was really just a human being. And people believed him. Many people, including church leaders, believed him. By some estimates, almost half of the Christians in the 4th century, at its peak, at the peak of Arianism, believed in Arianism. On the other side was St. Athanasius, later Bishop of Alexandria, who argued logically from the Bible and the rule of faith that the word, John 1.1, the word became man, Not that the word came into a man, like Arius taught, like dynamic monarchianism. Jesus Christ must be fully God and fully human. And he also argued from worship. Worship is primary in orthodoxy. 
that Christians have always worshipped Jesus as God. And Arius was a presbyter, a priest. So Arius, every, every liturgy, you're worshipping Jesus Christ. And if he's not God, then you're a pagan. So that's very logical. You're an idolater if he's not God. All Christians, even the Arians, believe that Jesus Christ saves. And there is that simple question. Only God can save. So Jesus must be God. And what do you mean there was a time when the Son was not? How could the Father be the Father if there was not always a Son? And so the Son is eternal and divine. And so St. Athanasius coined a term that we use today. It's an extra-biblical term. It was not found in the Bible. That Jesus is of the same essence as the Father, homosios. And in our creeds today, it sometimes is translated uh, of one essence or consubstantial. That's the really important word that comes out of the First Ecumenical Council that defends the divinity of Christ. And so this is why the Emperor Constantine in the 4th century called that council. That issue was absolutely critical to Christianity, but also to the empire because it was ripping at the seams. The reason that the bishops were invited, according to, Saint, to, according to Metropolitan John Zizulis, is because they were the ones who worshipped. They were the overseers of the consecration of the Holy Eucharist. And they were the ones who could could call on the Holy Spirit to guide them to a, to a decision of consensus. And that's another interesting thing about the way the Orthodox vote and make decisions. But similar to Acts 15, um, when the Jerusalem Council met, the first thing they replied was, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And this is what's significant about all of our ecumenical councils. The idea that under the consensus of the Holy Spirit, the answer will come forward. Not a democratic vote where some believe this and some believe that. You had to agree completely with the mind of the church. And this particular council was long and drawn out and not pretty, but ultimately the Holy Spirit um, guided the church to the decision. Arius lost the debate. St. Athanasius' view became the view of the church. And this is why our creed um, says that we believe in one God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, all things visible and invisible, against the Gnostics, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father, before all ages, eternal. Light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not created, and of one essence, or homosios, with the Father, through whom all things were made, against the Arians. These things we take for granted every Sunday that really blood, sweat, and tears throughout the centuries to try to prove the truth. And guess what? They're back. There's nothing new under the sun. Mormons deny that Jesus is truly the same essence as the Father. They're completely separate beings in Mormonism. Christian scientists reject the incarnation, but as I already mentioned, they're really more neo-gnostic. They don't believe the real world, the material world exists anyway. But it's the Jehovah's Witnesses who come closest to the Arian view, that they believe that Jesus is a created being, not God, but Michael the Archangel. And we all know, uh, as, I've already, as I've already repeated the first verse of St. John's Gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The New World Translation of the Jehovah's Witnesses adds an article. Add, they add the simple little letter A so that if they came to your door and opened up their Bible, they would show you their version, and it would say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was a God. He may be like a God, but he's just merely one among many created heavenly beings. When heretical views arise, you often find the proponents proof-texting, taking verses out of context, or out of the whole story, or out of the entire Bible. And so when asked, why later in that same gospel... To St. Thomas, say to Jesus, O kiriosmo, keotheosmo, my Lord and my God. Well, the answer is that Thomas, from the Jehovah's Witnesses, that Thomas was so startled to see Jesus that he swore. And really, sometimes all you can say is, Lord, have mercy. There's two more important heresies based on um, Greek philosophy, and one based on well, one based on Plato's ideas and the other on his student um, 
Aristotle's idea. The idea is, now that Jesus has been fully uh, confirmed as divine by the entire church, how do we talk about those two natures, the human and divine natures? And this is really kind of uh, where the Christological controversy uh, ends. So there were two, two views of thought. One is Apollinarianism, um, and this is kind of following St. Athanasius, wanting to emphasize Christ's divinity so much that it ends up kind of taking over. Um, it ends up taking over the, um, the discussion of how those two natures relate. Um, sorry, I'm sorry. So um, Apollinarius said that the divine soul took over the human soul of Jesus. In wanting to emphasize his divinity, the divine soul took over the human soul. That would explain how he could do miracles. Um, That would explain his sinlessness. But it had the great disadvantage of lessening his humanity. And that's a problem. It was Gregory the theologian, Gregory of Nazianzus, one of the Cappadocian fathers, who responded to this particular error by pointing out that what is assumed, what is not assumed is not healed. Human nature, not only part of human nature could be redeemed, all of human nature had to be redeemed. What is unassumed is unhealed. When we sing a hundred times at least at Pascha and after Pascha, the Christ has risen from the dead, he's trampled down death by death, he's bestowed life to those in the tombs, we, rest- we rely on a connected thread of understanding about Jesus being fully human and fully divine. It's meted out in all of our hymns. If we kind of pay attention to the, the hymns that are just dripping with the theology and the defense of Orthodox Christianity. The opposite of Apollinarianism was Nestorianism from the school of Antioch. Um, Nestorius was patriarch of Constantinople and he spoke of two sons, um, one divine son next to a human son. And he was accused of Um, dividing Jesus. Um, The two natures were in conjunction, not in union with one another. Further, Nestorius opposed the use of the term theotokos because he said Mary bore Christ. She bore a human son, not a divine son. His opponent was St. Cyril of Alexandria, who again insisted that Mary did bear God, and this is why it is correct for her to be called the Theotokos. When, um, when people that I teach, for example, at Fuller Theological Seminary hear the term Theotokos, and I do use the term, they often kind of think, you know, Mariology, there they go, worshiping Mary. But Theotokos is really a Christological term because it affirms that Jesus, that she gave birth to the true God, that he is God, not just a man. It's an important term for all of us to continue to use. The council at Ephesus settled that issue of the Theotokos. There's another council at Chalcedon that affirmed the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed, um, defended against several heresies, and issued a statement of its own, and I recommend kind of looking that up because the language of the councils um, really can help us defend against heresy even today. Nestorian tendencies also exist today. I think when we divide the world into material and religious things, um, spiritual and, you know, everyday, secular and spiritual, we're kind of dividing, we're dividing Christ into human and divine. Our life is incarnational. Our church is incarnational. We are, we are always theandric, both, both full, of, full of God and full of humanity. And our goal is to try to be more and more like Christ in his perfect humanity. So we can't really talk about, and Father Alexander Schmemann talks about the problem of secularism, is that we think there's two worlds going on, but there really is just only one world. Um, When we divide our lives or partition into spiritual versus religion, whether in the um, workplace or in the church, I think that's a problem. So as we move forward into history, I was looking at my watch, but I've already taken it off. As we move forward into history, several of the same heresies have returned. In the Enlightenment in the 19th and 20th century, they continue with the idea that Jesus is just a moral teacher. He is not divine at all. The resurrection is just a myth. 
Um, his death provided an example of self-giving love, which is kind of the mantra of the Enlightenment. And resurrection, at best, is a misunderstanding, and at worst, is a cover-up, because it was a humiliating end of a moral leader on the cross. So again, we might say, we're Orthodox, we don't need to worry about Enlightenment views of God. Um, Unfortunately, they're the ones who, in the last century, translated your English Bibles. And you may not realize the insidious tricks that they have used to lessen or eliminate the divinity of Christ. And in the present day, Protestant theologians and biblical experts not only deny the virgin birth, but also the divinity of Christ and his resurrection. Um, One of the translations, the RSV, the Revised Standard Version, according to Metropolitan Isaiah of the Greek Orthodox Metropolis of Denver, he's printed an article Um, And I actually have copies outside of his full article, but I'm going to summarize it for you. Um, The RSV is especially curious in its mix of Old and New English. The thee, thy, thous, and the you, ye, you, you are together. And he says at first this appears chaotic, but it actually is a hidden code. The traditional thou usage refers to God, but you refers to everyone else. So the um, Lord's Prayer is still thy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. But whenever Jesus is addressed in the entire New Testament in the RSV, it's he's you. For example, Matthew 16, 16. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Moreover, in truth, of course, um, Jesus is Mary's son, but not Joseph's son. But in the story of the presentation of Christ to the temple, when St. Simeon is returning Jesus to his mother, Luke 2, 33, the King James Version says, Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. But the RSV says, and his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. So the RSV infers that Joseph is Jesus' father, presumably his biological father, a clear refutation of the dogma of the virgin birth, a stepping stone to eliminating the ever-virginity of Mary, and really what it's trying to do is simply say that Jesus is a, is a human person and not divine. His eminence gives many, many more details, and I do recommend reading it uh, in my handout packet, but I just wanted to call your attention to the fact that you can't even trust the English versions of your Bible. And that will make it difficult for you to defend <laughs> Defend against that if if somebody was telling you that Jesus is not God, like my friend in my study group uh, who's got a Bible that doesn't simply call him, that doesn't say that he is thou. So this is one of the reasons that we Orthodox insist on interpretation of the Holy Scriptures from the mind of the church, um, since it was the church which determined the scriptural canon in the first place. So if I had to sum up my concerns here, getting close to the end, I would say... First of all, be wary of religious teachers in the media, like Joel Osteen, Benny Hinn, um, even Beth Moore, who is a very popular women's Bible study teacher. Um, She now has a TV program on TBN, and she has often stated that she believes God is prophetically speaking through her directly. Um, And in her studies, she does encourage women to rely more on their feelings than on biblical history. So that should be kind of a red flag. Especially be wary of any non-Orthodox spirituality books. And avoid altogether any spirituality books on Oprah's, Oprah's book list. <laughs> taking, your, taking your knowledge of the Bible from movies, uh, for example, the recent Exodus, God and Kings, starring Christian Bale, or the recent Son of God in 2014, is dangerous. But if there's a question about accuracy of anything you see or read, seek guidance from your priest or confessor, and, of course, read the Bible directly um, in the correct translation. (laughs) Discernment, or nepsis in the Greek, is um, the way of spiritual maturity. Most people are discerning in things that are important to them. Uh, We are discerning in what we eat. We read labels. We avoid salt. We avoid gluten, etc., high fructose corn syrup, Uh, people who do investing are careful about where they put their money. Even sports enthusiasts are discerning 
um, about you know what they're what they're watching or, or in sports. They know the defensive plays and the offensive plays, even the statistics um, of the game and the players. All of those things are basic skills that are needed in dis- discerning also the truth of our faith. We need to know the facts. We need to have the offensive understanding, the defensive understanding, um, analysis, attentiveness. In all that we do, our minds should be trained to look for and recognize the truth of God. We also have the added bonus as Orthodox Christians of the history of the church, of the unbroken connection to the apostolic faith, of the witness of the church fathers who have fought the fights of dogmatic truth ahead of us. We have resources to support us in our spiritual family. We have our learned reverend clergy, but especially we have the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit to guide us to keep the body of Christ whole and securely within the way, the truth, and the life of Jesus Christ. So was the story of Jesus just a myth? No. He is the historical redeemer. Is the Holy Bible merely a collection of writings promoting a particular philosophy? Absolutely not. The church recognized it as an account of the salvation history of the word of God incarnate. Can we choose to believe whatever we want about God? Of course not. That is the distinguishing feature between the Orthodox and the heretic, that we have a creed and that we have canons to mark out the boundaries between truth and heresy. We might say that the teachings of Orthodoxy are like the banks of a river. The banks are fairly wide because we have a lot of um, discernment, pastoral discernment within the banks. But there are established boundaries to dogma, and from that we cannot depart. God is the creator of everything that is good. Jesus Christ is the incarnate Logos, and he is homoousios with God, of the same essence with the Father. Mary is the holy Theotokos, because she birthed God in truth. And she is ever virgin. Council of Chalcedon, the Council of Nicaea, all of these councils gave us the language to help us defend the truth. But they are just markers. They are just boundaries. For example, Chalcedon says, the two natures of Christ are indivisible and inseparable, yet unconfused and unchangeable. They're just pointers to the truth. Because sometimes that's just the most honest and accurate thing we can say, is that we don't fully understand who God is. But here is what we know is absolutely true. So heresy is a choice to regressively bask in a false assumption about the most important dogmas of the Christian faith. And you can hold to a flat earth if you want to. It probably won't matter too much. But deviating from God's truth does matter in every possible way. So may we all come to recognize clearly that God is the Lord and has appeared to us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Thank you. Are we doing questions? Yeah, so if you have a question, um, please raise your hand, and I'll get to the microphone since we are recording. Um, I have a question. My question is, um, so you were talking about how our Bibles are translated by, you know, those who believed in maybe heretical teachings. So my question is, if you're talking to somebody, um, I'm thinking of like a family or something who is Protestant and they like want you to go to the Bible to tell them everything. And if you're talking about it, how do you, usually if it gets brought up that um, when you start talking about like, oh, well, there was, maybe there was a time, there was a time when the Bible as we know it didn't exist, you know, there's like, it's a collection of books, when you start talking about in the, that history, and how scripture um, is how we know it today, that's usually when they kind of like shut off, maybe, how can you talk about that without them saying, or even myself thinking like, oh, okay, well, what's the point, I can't even like trust my scripture or something. That's what you're telling me. So what am I supposed to do? So two things. Um, first of all, my pastor, Father Stephen Seclise, says 
If you're in a Bible study and the person who's leading the Bible study doesn't know Greek, you shouldn't, shouldn't trust them because you really need to look at the words underneath to find out what's really being said. But to your other point, which I think is the bigger point and more important for, for all of us, um, is that we t- Protestants tend to kind of talk about the book uh, as being really important. We know that sola scriptura was the key issue for Martin Luther and the rest of the Protestant Reformation. But in fact, those 27 books that we now recognize as being canonical in the New Testament, the truth, those 27 books didn't even show up on one list together until 367 AD. And so you can look back at history and tell your friends, you know, were there, were there true biblical apostolic Christians in the second century and the third century and the fourth century? Well, yes, of course there were. But they did not have a Bible the way we know it with the New Testament for many, many centuries. They had the rule of faith. It was, the, it was kind of the unwritten, even though meant much of the rule of faith was also written. They worshipped first. God revealed to them the truth. Um, they didn't have to write it down as theology until it was challenged in many cases, but their practices and everything they did are already there, how they baptized, how they, how they celebrated the Eucharist. So if there was no list of the New Testament until 367 by St. Athanasius in an Paschal encyclical, that's kind of the first place to start. Then the next step is, how did we get a canon? Um, how did we end up with what we now call the New Testament? And that really was a grassroots movement. It was the faithful, and not just the bishops, the faithful who, when they read the different letters, recognized it as true. And that's exactly what St. Athanasius said when he wrote this encyclical. Not, I am, I am mandating that you read this, not at all. Here is, what the, here is what your brothers and sisters in Christ are reading. And here is the list that we found to be connected to the truth of, of the God that we worship already. Does that make sense? So the canon later... Many, many centuries later, affirmed what the church, through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, had already come to believe. Um, St. Irenaeus earlier in the, in the second century, when they were debating which of the, which of the books should be gospel, there were ov- over 30 books, many of them Gnostic, with gospel in the title. And we end up with those four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. St. Irenaeus said that the, the church simply has affirmed what the Holy Spirit has taught, that those are the four. And so it, it, it becomes a little bit difficult, but you can point to history and point out that there were um, solid, orthodox, lowercase o and capital O, Christians who didn't have the Bible in the same way that we do today because the church was the preserver of truth. Thank you. I'm not a fan of the RSV, but I, I've, I've heard, you know, that that it's uh, the one that that Orthodox are kind of have been kind of expected to to uh, to have. I, I you know, I, I uh, like reading other translations, the Jerusalem Bible, you know, uh, um, our Orthodox Study Bible. Um, I'm not going to learn, uh, uh, you know, Japanese or Arabic or something like that. Maybe their translations are more accurate, and I'm not going to learn Greek. Um, you you mentioned reading the the, the right one or, or so, not not in the, not in those words. I'm not quoting yes. you, but uh, okay. Um, uh, uh, top three. You know, I actually didn't mention reading the right one. I, I, I think I, what I should have said, if I did, if I did say that, is to be discerning. Um, Metropolitan Isaiah also doesn't recommend one. His favorite is the King James, but he recognizes that the English is very difficult. So I think what you should do is kind of have a variety of, um, of translations. In our women's Bible study at St. Paul's, uh, we also have the Orthodox Study Bible, which is the, the New King James, but we have several others to kind of get a sense of what the translators are doing. And then, of course, I do have an interlinear with the Greek that kind of helps me. You know, I'm not fluent in um, the scriptural Greek, but I, I use the, the aids to kind of tell me what the words actually are. But I think really um, when it's not that difficult to know when something is departing from the mind of the church. The early church had a sense about it. That was the rule of faith. And they all seemed to agree. And so, um, you know, our academic side 
wants to know exactly which is the right translation, there isn't a right English translation. So um, new, NRS, a new, new revised standard version, I think, is a little closer. I've heard the same thing. Um, the 1952 RSV, the copyright is owned by the National Council of Churches USA, and they tend to be very liberal in their view of who Jesus is, generally. So, I, you know, I think we've just follow, followed the guidance of our, of our leaders in that. That's not much of an answer, but that's all I can offer. Just don't trust and be discerning. Don't trust completely your translations and be discerning. Forgive me, would you like to say something about philatism and its dangers and our struggle with it today? Philatism. Can you, can you explain? No, you please mean? you do. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm speaking. I, I really don't have anything to say about it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, early uh, in your lecture, you, you gave us a choice of things to choose. One had to do with the historical details, and the other had to do with the personal mm -hmm. relationship, I guess. It seems like the second one is, is a result of the increasing importance of revival, revivalistic kinds of language, which um, uh, where, where the the minister, or whoever it is that's leading a meeting, wants people to make a decision, right? They, they don't want them to leave the place and think about it. They wanted to make a decision right then. And Peter wanted people to make a decision too, right, in Acts. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems like the, the need to have people make a decision results in the way things are presented. And it seems like that results in this, this personal... <laughs> description of, you see where I'm going? So what, what can be done about that? I mean, uh, I went to Fuller, like you did, right? And, and for most of us there, if we were involved with working with young people, we wanted them to make a decision and we wanted them to have a living relationship and not just showing up to church at certain times, right? So do you see a relationship between the language and the, the problem? Or is there something I'm missing? I think you touched on a very important point. Uh, indeed, much of American religi would, religiosity, even Christianity in America, is individualistic. And that's one of the big differences with the Orthodox Church. Uh, we believe we're all saved together. Um, I think that kind of the, um, the Second Great Awakening and all of that enthusiasm is one aspect of it. There's also the Pentecostal uh, witness, the experience of individual um, gifting um, that tends to be a little bit more emotional than it is based in history. So I think we've got a lot of different factors that are all attacking us in the media, in the world, um, in world Christianity, that are not as focused on, on history. And so the two questions that I mentioned, he wasn't saying one is right and one is wrong, but the two always have to go together. And if you look in the, uh, the Acts of the Apostles, Whenever there is a sermon preached by St. Peter or St. Paul, they always go back at length and recount the entire history, salvation history of Israel through Jesus Christ. And they talk about you know, his birth and his witness and his miracles. and his, you know, He is the one that is connected to the Old Testament. And we don't ignore the Old Testament because he is the one that fulfills it. So you're, you're right. There are a lot of aspects. And depending on kind of where you're situated, you might be... You might be hearing different things. I mean, I, I've heard from many people that a lot of the hymns in Protestant um, denominations today are very my, my, me, my focused, and we can just take a look at our hymns. Um, you know, it, it is really the entire congregation, um, the entire church that has been elected by God to be his body. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm right here. Uh, I know that you're talking about kind of ancient heresies coming up into like re reforming in modern uh, groups. Uh, are there, would other things be considered modern heresies that aren't recreations of old heresies? For instance, in the Reformation, there's lots of 
different versions of Christianity popping up. Um, and, and often I find that when I'm talking to certain groups, I'm getting a different version of the faith or salvation or uh, whether there are mysteries or there's just symbols and stuff like that. Would, would any of those be considered heretical, uh, even though they're not necessarily addressing the divinity of Christ or whether mm-hmm. Mary is his mother, but, but maybe salvation or maybe the application or the way in which we're saved, would that be considered heretical in any way? So I guess it depends who you ask. Um, Until the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s, Roman Catholics considered Protestants to be heretics because they were not fully members of the church. So that word kind of gets thrown around. Now they've kind of, uh, after that, um, they've kind of backed away from that, and now they're in in relation to the Catholic Church, but but no longer heretics. Um, Heresy usually is specifically the dogmas of the most important things surrounding the faith. And there's um, certainly errors in other traditions. There's even been errors in orthodoxy. We know the iconoclast controversy. Um, There are certainly errors, but we have to kind of be careful and let those call the errors out. Um, But but heresy specifically is errors about God that that, that affect ultimately our salvation, not seeking and making mistakes. That's kind of the answer. I mean, there, there, I know what you're saying. There are a lot of diverse practices in other Christian um, traditions that are not at all like the Orthodox tradition. Um, and some people would call those heresies. And many, some, maybe some of them are based in heresy. Um, but I guess I'm trying to make it more black and white today because I, I, I don't want to get into that, you know, you're wrong and you're wrong and you're a heretic. And so be discerning. Yeah, my question was very much along the same lines about discernment and distinction. So at what point does what you believe become heretical? Because even within the Orthodox Church or outside of it, you know, there can be diverging viewpoints. And maybe a, a different way of asking it is that, and you just kind of touched on, you know, where heresy really lies, but, you know, there's a lot of divisional beliefs. Um, you know, I mean, I don't need, there's so many, I, where do we right. begin, right? 45,000 like, denominations. Right. Um, and so, at what point is it determined to be heretical? I guess that's, that's what I'm trying to understand. In my own mind, you touched on earlier that it's not until you're, you close your mind off to the possibility, but at the same time, I know a lot of people who leave themselves open to any possibility, mm-hmm. and so is that, in and of itself, almost heretical if you never really solidify on any belief, Right. So that second one would be kind of, you would say, maybe leaning toward Gnostic, where you're just kind of waiting for God to tell you what is right and what is wrong. We do have the benefit of a 2,000-year-old church that has fought a lot of these fights. And so I I, I think the important thing is to go back and look at history, because all of the problems have already been outlined. Um, So um, the first thing you said... um, All the different denominational beliefs. There's a lot of diversity. How do you know when your belief has left the bounds of orthodoxy, either lowercase o or capital O? Um, Because the church has very definitive teachers, teachings about dogma. And I mentioned several of them. That's how you know. Um, You need to kind of look at what the church fathers say. And again, I'm speaking black and white with regard to heresy. The other things, there are um, lots of pastoral opinions You're going to have St. Basil say something, and you might have one of the other saints say something different. And so in some things, there's a lot of leeway. And you ask your priest or your spiritual father, kind of what is the, what, in what direction should you be going? But Jesus is God. God is the creator. We are, we are created beings. I mean, all of those dogmatic issues, um, they really, the reason we call them dogma is because those are things you must believe in order to be orthodox. So for Roman Catholics, it is dogma to believe in the Immaculate Conception of Mary, those kinds of things, and that's why we call them dogma. If your mind is not in agreement, um, you have to kind of pray about that, work through that. I know there are issues, um, kind of secondary issues that I've struggled with, and I just kind of say, well, the mind of the church, I have to trust the Holy Spirit working. That is our holy tradition, is that the Holy Spirit working throughout the church, throughout the centuries, in the midst of all of us. And so the the simple answer is um, Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. That is is not orthodox. 
you've got to try to come back into the fold and attune your mind to the mind of the church.